Good evening, everybody. Nick Thompson here, the Gut Doctor. We are going for a rerun from last week because we had technical issues, but Rosie and I were working very hard on the problem last year, last week, and I think we've cracked it. So uh, I'm not expecting any problems this week. Tonight, we're going to be talking about herbs, healing, and inflammation in themselves. It's a day's lecture. But we're just going to put them together and just have a little wander through some concepts within herbs healing and inflammation i hope everybody's well and i hope uh that uh you're beginning to enjoy the early springtime that we've got and uh that you enjoy and get something good from this evening now I'm going to give you some slides and, and we'll, we'll uh, go through some of the concepts that we're sharing this evening. And then uh, at the end, we can look at some questions. If you have any questions, please put them in the uh, comments at the side and then we can, we can go through those then. So without any further ado, all I'm going to do is go like that. I come into the corner. And then we'll put the slides up like that. And I'm just going to have a little chat about those here. And I hope that Rosie's able to hear me, that you can all hear me. Uh, she says that we're in good shape. So uh, I'm going to say good evening to everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. And here we go. Herbs, Healing and Inflammation the Gut Doctor series. We're going to be meeting again, by the way, uh, on Thursday, the 18th of May, just a couple of weeks down the line, in order to uh, do some more talks about gut health and herbs. Please join us then Thursday, the 18th of May at seven o'clock, the usual time. We're just getting back on, on track. So um, I'm going to start with inflammation. Inflammation has been with with us, has been with our animals forever. It's a very ancient response to trauma. The, uh, the, the, the Romans, in particular Celsus, 2,000 years ago, set down some of the parameters that are, are, are make up a classic inflama inflammatory response. Some inflama inflammatory uh, responses don't have all four of these uh, elements and some authors describe these four elements of inflammation and also loss of function uh, um, just so that you've, you've you've got that as background it's an interesting um, um, element of medicine so Celsus said there are four elements to inflammation. There is tumor, which is Latin for growth, as you can imagine. There is dolor, which is Latin for pain, as this strange individual on the screen is <laughs> showing with arrows in, in, in him. There is calor, which, as you can guess, is heat. We see heat with inflammation, with most inflammation, not all. And rubor, redness, we see redness with inflammation. So it means that if, uh, if I come along and kick you in the shin, you, you will see tumor, you will see growth because you'll get a, a little an egg on your shin where you've been kicked. It will probably be painful. Even a day later, there will be pain because there's an inflammatory response going on. There will maybe, maybe not be discernible heat in the in the area where on your shin. And there may or may not be heat, even if you can't see it. Actually, I've, I've done some work using a, 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 um, a point, a pointing um, thermometer. And even if you can't see inflammation, for example, on horses, if you using a, a, a digital thermometer, you can actually detect that there there is an inflammatory response. What's interesting in horses actually is that if they've got chronic back problems, for example, you won't get inflammation. Well, you may have done initially if they when they did the original damage, but after time, you get actually get that area. It, it, it appears as a cold area, where the where the uh, the the, the uh, body has kind of 
shut down and there's spasm and improper um, blood supply to the area. So tumor, dolor, calor, rubor. These are the elements of inflammation that you, you I can remember being taught them actually uh, in uh, uh, by Alec Cleland uh, in the the dissection room at the Royal Dick School of Veterinary Studies in the in the 80s. Yeah, in my first year of vet school, he was talking about this lovely, great teacher. And uh, he, he, he introduced us to these concepts. So these are the elements of, um, of inflammation. Um, let's discuss that a little bit further and bring in the idea of healing with inflammation. One could argue that one of the first rules of, of healing is to reduce, reduce unnecessary inflammation so i'm introducing the concept of necessary and necessary helpful inflammation and unnecessary inflammation what is necessary helpful inflammation well imagine if you have broken your leg or let's say you've sprained badly sprained your ankle in order to prevent further trauma to the already traumatized ankle, you will get necessary and helpful inflammation and you will feel, you will feel swelling, you will feel pain, you will feel heat, um, heat and you will, it, there will be redness. Why will those things come along? There will be swelling because there will be um, increased blood supply to the area, which will also contribute to the increased redness. Um, there will be inflammatory uh, cytokines being released, which means that there is a, a, a swelling of the cells and the intracellular area in order to immobilize yeah, to me means that that ankle is less able to 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 move because this swelling restricts the movement. Okay, um, uh, calor, you'll see extra heat because of the increased blood supply and the in increased inflammatory activity, um, and it will be painful. Why is it painful? Yeah pain is 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 pain is a pain so why do why do we need it? it's to to isolate and and reduce further in further pain that is to say if you had if you if you sprained your ankle badly and you couldn't feel that it was painful absolutely pound to a penny you just carry on walking on it yeah we've all done it if you if it doesn't feel too bad you get you know you'll get up and go to work the next day or you'll carry on that 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 game of football game of hockey whatever um and so the body very wisely steps in with pain because with our patients horses cats and dogs pain is the only thing that will immobilize them will immobilize a joint and even then it, it, it is possible, you know, if you've got an old arthritic dog who's got painful joints and they see a squirrel, the body can override these things. But just coming back, therefore, to the, the, the idea of, of, of inflammation. Inflammation has helped us throughout, and our dogs and our cats and our horses, has helped us throughout inflammation more than it's hindered us. And pain is a necessary part of that inflammatory. Inflammation, by the way, guys, is different from infection. Infection is where um, uh, uh, microbes have entered the body and may have then caused an inflammatory response. Okay, so you can have inflammation without infection. Yeah, if you sprain your ankle, you haven't got any bugs in there, hopefully. You haven't got any bugs in there, but you have got all the signs of inflammation. However, if you um, scratch your ankle on a rusty nail, then you will get an infection of your ankle and it will look pretty similar to you having ricked it or, or, or sprained it. 
but it will be from a, an infectious cause. You will get inflammation from an infection. Okay, similar concepts, but very important to separate those in your in your in your thinking process. Um, just going to check that. Yeah, Rosie's still happy. That's great. So the 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 opposite of that, therefore, is un necessary inflammation what does unnecessary inflammation look like in humans and in our dogs well if you think about ibs uh, irritable bowel syndrome where there's no actual change in the in the bowel there may be uh, underlying levels of inflammation OK, and and uh, that would be considered pathological uh, inflammation. If you had IBD, um, inflammatory bowel disease, there's the word inflammatory, then you've actually got visible change there. And if you if you or your dog, for example, are reacting negatively. So for humans, it, the classic would be reacting negatively to strawberries or to shellfish or something like that. And for dogs, wheat, beef and chicken are, are often um, um, allergens. OK, so that would be inflammation, which was counterproductive to the good functioning of the gut and of the general system if your gut is in, inflamed it's you're not going to absorb nutrients as well uh, for example um, if you as a human have asthma that is counterproductive inflammation of your airways and your lungs and that's going to hinder you more than it's going to help you. That's where the body thinks it's being attacked and therefore sets up an inflammatory response in the in the airways and the lungs. Um, in humans, hay fever. Uh, pollen is not the cause of hay fever. Your body's mistaken immune response to those pollens is the cause of the inflammation in your your eyes and your ears and your nose and your mouth and what have you it's not pollen of course hay fever it's your response to pollen okay so that would be if you like unnecessary and maybe even counterproductive inflammation um interesting concepts and and, and i hope that's that's um clarified a few things with regard to this now Talking of healing, healing is not always what you add to a system. OK, so what am I saying here is that the good medicine is not always that you need to add something to to a, a, a an ailing animal. Um, for example, antibiotics may be necessary, but if they're used where they're not, absolutely vital they can have a negative effect on the microbiome of gut and skin and therefore long term have that medicine can have a negative effect on the constitution on the on the general welfare of the of the animal human down the line okay so sometimes not giving an antibiotic is more beneficial in the short and long term than than uh, giving an antibiotic. Meticam is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. I'm sure you're familiar with it. And uh, some dogs, for example, can get a uh, an inflammatory, an enteritis, as a result of using Meticam. And therefore, if when you give the metacam to the dog you get a, this negative response yes it might be helping with the you know sore ankle or sore neck or whatever it might be but it, it may be the best medicine for that dog is to remove the metacam and possibly think of uh, herbs uh, anti-inflammatory herbs we're going to talk about anti-inflammatory herbs in a second 
And then coming on to some, some of my favorite um, topics in medicine is the, the, the idea of, of, of worming. I think in the West, in Europe, that often we don't need to use chemical wormers. Um, I think that uh, these things are overused. And the reason that I say that is that I do a lot of worm counts on my patients and most of them are negative for worms, where in previously they've been using regularly using wormers after years and years of not using uh, wormers they are still worm free so i think that you know using the uh, the brevectos the milbamax the drontals of this world if they are completely necessary then fine but i think that most of the time and i'm talking probably more than 95% of the time, I think that they're probably not necessary. And, and as an example, and this is just an excuse for me to show, show off my beautiful girls here, these two have, uh, have uh, looking at the, the previous slide, they've never had an antibiotic between them. A bluebell in the background is four, a mouse in the foreground is two now. And between them, so six dog years, never had an antibiotic. Uh, if you think of the middle section of the last slide, we've, they've never had a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. And the last section, they have never had a worm uh, product at all. What they get, and the chickens and the, the peacocks and everything, they will get, we use Vermex uh, on them. It's a herbal product. Uh, on all the creatures and the cat and everybody else and uh, very well they do and there's the proof of the pudding um, for in terms of you know external fleas and what have you we use products like this this is the the vermex flea and tick products um, you know th this Gut Doctor is is it's sponsored by them. They help me to be able to put time aside to talk to you, for which I'm very grateful. But um, I use those products because they are effective, and I've looked at a lot of products in my time, and those are the ones that we use here, and uh, we do like them very much, and they're, they're very help helpful uh, family run bunch as well. Anyway. So I'm not gloating when I say that these these dogs, six dogs year, dog years between them, I'm not gloating I, because I think you'd be surprised if I said, oh, yes, they have they have Milba Max every month and they have Brevecta every three months and everything else. Um, it just shows that it is possible and these, these dogs are doing incredibly well. They're raw fed and what have you. And I think some of the best medicine for these two is we don't give them antibiotics if at all possible obviously if they were desperately sick or or you know dying of infection or you know even very very unhappy because of a really hideous infection i would use an antibiotic with them um, if they had an overwhelming parasite burden i would consider using a, a pharmaceutical as well but there we go. We've been lucky and these girls have done very well indeed. There you go. Let's talk about herbs. Just going to check how we're doing for time. <clears throat> so some, so let's have a little run through some nice anti-inflammatory herbs. And the reason for showing you these is, is, is to say, right, this is what inflammation is about. This is the, these are the good sides of inflammation. These are the bad sides of inflammation use any product be it a pharmaceutical or a herb with judiciously in order to get the best uh, the best um results for your dog i prefer where possible using anti-inflammatory herbs over using uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories i'll talk about that just at the end we're going to see some herbs now so Turmeric is 
it, it's very trendy at the moment and you can you can get golden paste is 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 is, is all the rage but i just want to re-emphasize how safe turmeric is and how very 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 powerful it's powerful uh anti-inflammatory it's a, it's a healer it's it has anti-cancer properties it's a, 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 a carminative for the gut, helps with digestion. Um, and so it's, it's a very strong anti-inflammatory. And um, it's even used, our friends who make uh, Metacam, they actually used uh, cur uh, curcumin. Yeah, you see it's called curcuma longa. So when they I, I take, took out an extract, it was called curcumin. And um, it was known uh, uh, from scientific studies to be an effective anti-inflammatory. So uh, never forget turmeric as a as if you're if you're looking for anti-inflammatory effects. I think the only downside of, of turmeric is it stains like mad. <laughs> but there you go, all good. Makes curries taste divine. Um, another very obvious anti-inflammatory is the is the ancient willow bark we use uh, uh salix alba which is the white willow salix is the willow alba is the white willow um uh this is what it looks like there's a the white willow and salix is the latin goes back to linnaeus a couple of hundred years ago um, and salix is where they get salicylic acid, which was the original, and willow was the original source of salicylic acid, which is aspirin, okay? The reason they called it aspirin is that the Americans started going into mass production, and they found they could get more salicylic acid from aspira filipendula, which is a which is a kind of a, a, a weedy herb, and so they called their new product aspirin, not salicin or something, uh, because it was from uh, salix. And another little story: I was I was raised in Chipping Norton, and we used to go um, sledging in winter down by the but down by the brook. And so the story goes: there was a there was a a, a, a priest, a, a, a man of the church in Chipping Norton, who discovered that using and chewing the bark from the willow trees down there, and we're talking 1750s or something like that, that that will have this anti-inflammatory, anti-pain and effect. Okay, so there you go. That's a little shout for uh, the white willow and uh, um, Chipping Norton. Um, one, of the, one of the products that we use, which contains white willow, is this wonderful stuff called Salogesic. It's a, it's a prescription thing. There are products, and have a look at the, uh, the Vermex page for products containing turmeric and uh, white willow and, and what have you. Yeah, there's some new products that are out now that you might want to have a look at. They're called um, toppers, toppers, as in you sprinkle the herbs on top of food. So we've got turmeric, we've got uh, salix alba, and then we've got this, the humble but oh so powerful and interesting urtica dioca, which is the nettle, okay? So nettle, has been used for hundreds if not thousands of years as an anti-inflammatory um it's it's a lymphatic it helps with uh reducing inflammation which is which is ironic because if you uh if you fall into a, a bunch of nettles you will immediately see all the signs of inflammation you'll see the swelling you'll see the redness you'll see the pain and you'll see the heat okay so this is classic human uh um nettle rash from falling in a in, in a pile of nettles okay 
Interestingly, though, in the human situation, this is a condition, an allergic condition, nothing to do with nettles, and it's curl called, yep, you guessed it, it's called urticaria, okay? Again, not caused by nettles, but because it looks like nettle rash, they called it, it's named many, many, many years ago, urticaria, okay? And we, uh, we see it also in dogs like this. If you see a dog who's got urticaria, it's because most likely they have either been stung by something which has set up a, a degree of um, immune response or they've eaten something um, that, that has caused a degree of immune response. See it in horses a bit here and there. It's not that common in dogs, possibly more common in horses. Um, don't remember ever seeing it in cats. But um, it, you, you do see it in animals here and there. And when you see it, you, the, 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 the trick is to, A, treat the, 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 the symptoms. And you can use herbs, anti-inflammatory herbs, homeopathic, urticaria. Urtica uh, as a homeopathic is, is potentially a good one. Um, um, and then you've got to think, what caused it? Uh, is, there, is it resp uh, related to a food, for example? So... Uh, interesting stuff. Um, what I wanted to say about the beauty of anti-inflammatory herbs as opposed to anti-inflammatory uh, pharmaceuticals is that the pharmaceuticals are sometimes so good at their job that they can actually cause problems. If you've got a dog who has got arthritis, um, and you get given some metacam, which eliminates the uh, the sensation for that dog, the, the inflammation for that dog. That means that that old dog who still has arthritis, old age osteoarthritis, they're going to go jumping about and chasing squirrels and chasing everybody in the park and what have you, and that therefore may induce an increase a may um accelerate the, the the generation of those joints so this is why i when i'm treating arthritic arthritic dogs and i treat loads of arthritic dogs um i will always use a herbal and 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 supplements uh before i go for the non-steroidals um and um I tend not to use Metacam. I, there are other non-steroidals that you you can discuss with your vets. I I, I would suggest um, that my experience is not good with Metacam. Your vet may say otherwise, but um, I would not give it to my dogs. So there you go. Word to the wise. Um, just to end the show, let's just talk about healing herbs. This is a, a, a really positive uh, element within uh, herbal medicine and what i was going to say was when we talk about anti-inflammatory herbs they are not just anti-inflammatory okay if you've got a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory like our friend metacam like that basically it it reduces inflammation and that's about it okay uh pharmaceuticals they have a very narrow range of action usually Herbs, on the other hand, because they contain four to six hundred elements, uh, chemical elements within them, can have a very broad uh, range of action. OK, so uh, when we when we talk about anti-inflammatory herbs, they are not just anti-inflammatory herbs. It's just what the, the, the more prominent um, quality about them is anti-inflammatory or maybe it's just we're lazy humans we don't we just use these things for that healing herbs on the other hand are used much more broadly so um jinko is is wonderful healing herb and i put it into a lot of formulae when we're looking for um the, a healing response and the primary reason that we use ginkgo as well as being an antioxidant and a vulnerary and um, uh, what have you 
is as is to enhance and and um, potentiate circulation, especially to the brain and to the head. Okay, uh, there will be positive circulatory effects in the whole body. The other um, herb that we use is, is prickly ash, xanthoxylum, which will have more of a let's stimulate blood supply to the body, uh, uh, whereas ginkgo is supply um, blood to the brain. Um, Critagus hawthorn will help to improve blood supply to the heart. Okay, so enhancing blood supply is, a, is wonderful because it helps to regulate and then disperse inflammatory and healing responses. So there you go, things about Jinko you may not have known. Another very interesting one that you may have come across is Astragalus. The Sunday best name is Astragalus membranaceus. Um, and the common name is milk fetch. It's very commonly used. The uh, the Chinese love uh, milk fetch. It's called milk fetch, um, not because of the flowers, but the, the part that is used is the root. And here's the root. And you can see it's quite a pale. And when I look at that, I can almost taste the sweetness, taste the, 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 the almost nutritious uh, uh, fla flavors of it it's it's kind of it's almost like mother's milk yeah and milk veg um so it the, the the roots will be taken they will be uh and, and the the um active elements will be extracted and they are very nourishing very um um healing um i always think of astragalus sounds like uh, struggling. So when I've got a patient who is struggling, struggling with old age, struggling uh, uh, after after whelping, struggling post-operatively, then I will use something like a straggler, sometimes combining it with with uh, withania, for example, for gentle nurturing effects. So all the herbs that we've mentioned are very safe the very broad margin but i would suggest if you're thinking about herbs you know a do your homework and b if you've got a a herbal vet uh, close by work in, in tandem with them it's a very good idea um finally one of my favorite healing herbs chamomile often have it before bed because it's um uh, helps with sleep. My mum was a big fan of chamomile tea before bed, and <laughs> I've taken up that. Uh, chamomile uh, um, is the is the is a healer, a vulnerable, and especially uh, healing of the gut. If you've got any gut issues, then slippery elm, uh, marshmallow root, wonderful. But uh, chamomile is um the mother of the gut and um very very healing indeed you can make up a tea or you can get your tea bag and you can just uh, sprinkle the, the the tea bags on or you can look for herbal preparations that actually contain chamomile it's very gentle slightly bitter therefore it's got it gives your liver a little tiny bit of a boost um absolutely wonderful very very safe um, great to use if you want one wonderful healing element it's it's we'll be using it for gut so um there you go guys a little run through about health healing and inflammation i'm going to come back to you here uh like that and hide there and just um let's have a wee look <laughs> immediately see jane eastwith yeah, he's saying, uh, let's see if I can put this up here. There we go. What's she saying? Metacam is prescribed by Smarties. I don't feel that I ever want to use it ever again. I don't like using it, Jane. You're absolutely right. If your vet says, I'm going to give you some Metacam, I think it's completely justifiable to say, um, I've heard bad things about it. Is it possible to look at another non-steroidal anti-inflammatory i think that's a reasonable thing to say 
Um, uh, let's have a look. Tima. Hi, Tima. So what can we use nettles for? Nettles, sorry, nettles, nourishing. So um, what you can do is you can pick nettles. Make sure the dog hasn't peed on them. Yeah, if they're in the garden. But you can pick them and just steam them and add them to the food as a as a nutritive. Um, they are uh, mildly anti-inflammatory. Um, you can use them to as a as a if you if you steam them, you can use them as a poultice as an anti a local topical anti-inflammatory. Um, and um, in formulae, when I make up a formula, if I'm looking for kind of an antihistamine, um, summer, itchy, allergic type uh, if, uh, effect, um, then uh, Urtica will be quite high on the list there. So there you go, Timo, there's some thoughts. Uh, uh, Vivian, <laughs> Vivian, thank you. <laughs> it's nice to talk to you again today, Vivian. Um, Okay, so I'm just going to go back and have a look. Yeah. Hi, Janet. Hi, Poppy. Uh, let's have a look. Yeah, Jules says um, that she's using devil's claw as an anti-inflammatory. Yep, it's great. It's a big, it's a big pain thing, pain herb. Um, there are lots out there, actually. Um, the book, oh, I've got my computer lying on it. The book you need to, if anybody's interested in, in the book, um, I described it on Raw Pet Medics. We do a show called Raw Pet Medics on Facebook and um, on Tuesday, and I described a book. It's by Schoen, S-C-H-O-E-N and Wynn, W-Y-N-N. Showing and win it's called complementary and alternative veterinary medicine is is a good uh, uh book it's for a general view of complementary therapies but if you want to get really into um herbal medicine then have a look at another one called win and by win and food fougere it's the same win and fougere f-o-u-g-e-r-e -E, barbara fougere who is a a, a, a titan in the veterinary herbal world and it's called veterinary herbal medicine you can get them on amazon or wherever you get your books definitely worth looking at these things um uh <laughs> jane you're saying the right things yes they are beautiful dogs we love them and they uh, I, I just take just such great joy in getting them out twice a day it just does me so much good um there you go uh let's have a look Ah, here we go. Tima, once again. Um, she gets turmeric. Good, 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 good. Good, good, good. That's nice. Blending with an egg and carries the bowl around. <laughs> well, she's a lab. What do you expect, Tima? There we go. Um, and uh, Vermix are saying, if you want to have a look at their uh, organic collection, then um, that's that's one to look at. That's one wonderful. Yeah, good. Last last observation here. Emma, Emma Mott has said, great. Thanks, Emma. I really appreciate your thoughts. Yeah, this is this is, if you like, zoo pharmacognosy, where animals often know and will be drawn to herbs, plants that they need they don't know that they need the healing all they know is there's something changes in their body and they have a craving for that thing white willow it's going to be it's going to be fairly bitter but uh bitter many bitter plants actually have many um healing and uh medicinal effects um so definitely worth 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 looking along those lines um there you go, uh, guys. Thanks for thanks for everybody saying thank you. Um, that's great. I hope that's been useful. Again, 
Thursday, the 18th of May, we're going to be uh, we're going to be coming back and talking about herbs and health and, and what have you. Thank you for being with me. I'm going to go now. I'm way over time. I apologize. Um, sorry for the cock up last week. And I hope we've made up for it with a little bit of extra time today. Great to talk to you. All the very best, everybody. Thank you. Over and out. And um, uh, be healthy. Use your herbs. Thanks. Bye bye.